Virginia Tech basketball is struggling while UVA is finding itself. And the new football coaches taking over the Hokies and Hoos are assembling their staffs. All that, a downer of an ending to bowl season for the Virginia schools and the ACC's basketball woes. This week on Teal and Barber. Welcome in to episode 72 of Teal and Barber and a happy new year. This is the first 2022 edition of the Richmond Times Dispatch and Richmond.com's Virginia Tech, UVA, and ACC Sports Podcast. I'm Mike Barber, ACC beat writer for the paper, and joining me here as always, my co host, the 13 time Sports Writer of the Year and the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer, Mr. David Teal. David, how are you? Good morning, Mike. Well, uh, happy new year to you and your family. Thank you. Same to yours. Now, I'm, I'm curious because in our house, we, uh, we let our, our oldest, our eight-year-old, stay up till midnight. And um, that was quite an endeavor because it meant playing a lot of board <laughs> games. I, I think as much to keep my wife and I awake as it was to keep her awake. Uh, what did you do in the Teal household? Uh, does, does Tiny Teal care about being up till midnight? And, and how about you and the missus? Do you care about that uh, at this point? Well, Mike, most years we would. I happen to test positive for COVID on New Year's Eve. So I spent New Year's Eve and have not left since my bedroom. Isolation. What does David Teal do to pass the time in isolation? A lot of stretching, a lot of <laughs> isometrics, uh, some television. Thank goodness. New Year's, New Year's Day, January 2nd, a lot of sports to consume. Uh, but um Really looking forward to about four hours and 57 minutes from now. But who's counting when I believe Jill will allow me to break quarantine? No, looking forward to that. And, and I believe I'll see you uh, for my birthday, yes, uh, in Chapel Hill on Saturday? That's the plan right now, yes. Yeah, well, that would be quite the uh, way to spend my, my 43rd watching uh, UVA at UNC from what I assume are still uh, seats way, 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 way up in the up in the clouds there at the uh, Dean Dome. Uh, well, like I said, Happy New Year. And, and a year ago, I got a little bit of uh, feedback from our listeners when I said that my New Year's resolution was to eat more gourmet cheese. And, and I guess they thought that that didn't really rise to the level of, of what should be a... Uh, a New Year's resolution. Hopefully the audience will appreciate my selection this year. I'm, I'm aiming for, as, as you and I have talked about often, uh, a better work to personal life balance uh, as we kind of navigate this pandemic that's still going on, everything that goes on with our jobs, and, and uh, both of us have, have young ones. And uh, how about you, David? Do you do the, the New Year's resolution thing? You know, I don't. Jill does. She's, she's much better at it than I in, in setting and reaching goals. Uh, I wish I was uh, as kind of focused as that. I, Among my many character flaws is I just tend to drift into, into routine. But I, 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 think, I think your resolution, Mike, is one we can all aspire to. Because let's face it, in an era of technology and in a time when so many of us are working if not exclusively, almost so from our homes, work can be all consuming and little, uh, little family time never hurt anyone. Yeah. It sounds maybe almost funny to say it this way, but because our jobs are, are fun, <laughs> it, it's almost easier to be consumed by it. Right. Cause it, at times it doesn't feel like I'm working or I'm grinding. If you're you know, watching extra basketball or, um, pouring through some stats, doing some research. We love this stuff. And um, it is hard to sometimes remember to look up and say, how much time have I spent <laughs> doing this today as opposed to some of the other things we, we have going on? Well, we still do it because we love it. And, and let's talk about what's going on. And let's start with what's going on at Virginia Tech with their basketball program. Sure. The Hokies there and, and, and Mike Young. Uh, you and I both had high expectations for this team coming into the year. A lot of basketball left. But right now, David, they're, they're down at the, the bottom of the ACC standings. They're one of, uh, I think, three teams, right, still searching for their first league win along with uh, Pitt and, Ge and Georgia Tech. Uh, what are we seeing right now from the Hokies? Well, what we saw last night, Mike, was a tired basketball team. 
And that's to be expected coming off a, a COVID pause where you weren't able to practice in large numbers and NC State at home, uh, NC State at Castle, meaning home for Virginia Tech, comes in there having lost five in a row, desperate team the Wolfpack was with some with some talent now. Darian Sebron, <laughs> he, he might be the ACC player of the year eventually. Right now, he probably is. And he's just such a load, especially <clears throat> on the offensive end. But I just thought Virginia Tech's dead legs, Mike, showed late. You know, gave up, well, I think it was 11 second half offensive rebounds. And there was that one possession late where the Hokies are nursing a one point lead and NC State got five, count them, five offensive rebounds on the same possession. It's just brutal. Right. And then finally, Ebenezer Dewana, his only bucket, he finishes that possession with a stick back. It's his only bucket of the game, gives NC State the lead, and Virginia Tech never led again. And and then further down the stretch, Keve Aluma, Virginia Tech's best player and a terrific free throw shooter, front rims two free throws. What's that tell you? Legs. They were just tired. Yeah, and, I think it's a great point. And, and the other thing that illustrates what you're talking about there is, David, they went on a 17-0 run at mm-hmm. one point. I mean, you don't do that if you're not at least equal to, if not better than your opponent, if you're not sure. capable. Um, so I, I think we saw in that run, yeah, Virginia Tech is still a good basketball team, but I think you're right. I, I just think um, they ran out of gas in a very visible way, right? Like um, you mentioned the free throws. It, it just seemed like there was nothing in the tank for the final, I don't know, 10 to 12 minutes of that game. Yeah, exactly. It, it's it's almost, Mike, you mentioned that 17-0 run. 14-0 of it came at the end of the first half. Right. And it's almost like that, that gassed them, that after that they were done. And then later, NC State goes on, I believe it was an 18-2 to 2 binge, and the Hokies just weren't able to recover. So here they are 0-3, I think if I'm Mike Young and I'm his training staff and his strength and conditioning staff, I'm grateful that this weekend in the the natural ebb and flow of the schedule is an open date for the Hokies. So they now have a chance, presumably with them all healthy because there were no unavailable players last night, to get their sea legs back before, I think it's Wednesday night, right, when they play at JPJ. Yep, and that's uh, you, you and I have the, talked a few times about. This is not a very deep team, right? Um, and I looked but, at but, the weekend schedule and I thought to myself, I was actually going to text you this morning. They've had a couple games PPD. I was curious how do the other schedules line up. Pittsburgh was in Syracuse, so it couldn't happen. But uh, I'm thinking if the ACC had called Mike Young and said, "Can we do a makeup game?" He would have said, "Let's let's not." Uh, yeah, because I think this time you're right is valuable for them. Yeah, I, I think it really could be. And as as you and I uh, texted among ourselves last night, what really needs to happen also for Virginia Tech is Naheem Ali needs to just mm-hmm. rediscover his shot. I mean, he goes two for 11 last night, and he's 15 for 64 in his last seven games. And the Hokies just aren't going to survive that. Yeah, they're not deep enough. And again, we talked about this so much before this even even started. We really liked the first five or six. We wondered about what else was there. We said they couldn't afford an injury. Well, they also can't afford uh, a protracted slump from one of those first five, and especially not a score of Elaine's talent, which you know you and I saw that in, in Indianapolis, how he can just um, take over a game with his scoring ability. They, they need that. They need that counterpunch, that one-two uh, with Keve Aluma. Now, on the flip side, what's going right at UVA, who um, – I think some people were shoveling a little bit of dirt on after they got you know, buried by Clemson, a 17-point home loss, uh, December 22nd. That was the most lopsided home ACC loss for Virginia in a decade. Since then, cutting down turnovers, hitting a few more shots. What are we seeing? Well, as our friend Seth Greenberg, Mike, often says, it's a make or miss game. And boy, does UVA kind of embody that right now what did they shoot in the second half against clemson it was it low 20s yeah it it was it was in the 20s somewhere and since you know 52 and change at syracuse 54 percent last night at clemson 
you know, the, the Cavaliers going to win a lot of games when they shoot 50%. He, here, here's my question, because Virginia is not going to shoot. 50 percent every night nobody is and francisco cafaro is not going to go three for three and two for two from the line and throw down this thunderous dunk and get eight points a night like he did last evening but can virginia just find that happy medium man where just shoot 45 percent, 44 percent lean on that defense a little bit and you win the game they haven't been because you know they were so bad on offense against JMU and so bad on offense against Clemson. They can just find that happy medium. You know maybe they can roll off a, a little run here. Yeah, you, you know one of my favorite statistics of the Tony Bennett era is this team is 140 and 11 when they hit 70 points. Yeah, 70 is not a lot of points in college basketball, right? Like we, we see teams that average 77, 78 routinely. Uh, if they can hit 70, uh, they're, they're virtually unbeatable with the way they traditionally play defense. And um, that said, this is going to be a, a stretch to get to 70 with this group. Is it still as simple, David, as, hey, if Armand Franklin gets going from outside, it's a different offense? Well, he didn't get going from outside last night, Mike. Right. He wouldn't make he, – he make one three. Mm-hmm. I, I think I have that right. You do. But, 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 but his mid-range game was exceptional. And – you know, maybe in the scope of this offense, that that's where it can come. And then, you know, that that three off the left wing from Kihei Clark last night. Wow, that was beyond clutch. And the the, the second consecutive game in, in which he's provided that. But I, I was really struck, and I mentioned Kafaro earlier. Here's kind of a interesting yin and yang of the two Clemson games. First game against the Tigers at JPJ, Virginia got zero bench points. Last night, eight from Cafaro, five from Cody Statman, and two from Tane Murray. Fifteen. That's, you know, if, if, if Virginia can get maybe even six, eight, ten points a night off that bench, to me that could be just what the Cavaliers need to get over the hump in most contests. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, it's it's not about finding a guy to give you 14 points off your bench. It's just finding a, a con- co- collection of guys, really, to just give you something, give you that. Essentially, it's look at it this way. Think of the bench as Virginia's number three scorer. <laughs> if, they can, if they can get you 10 to 12 and we call them your number three scorer, I think you're right. I think they'll be okay. Another statistical change from the first matchup that I thought was significant, especially with what's coming in the schedule. In the first game against Clemson, Virginia gave up 22 points off turnovers and eight second chance points. In this victory at Clemson, they cut both of those numbers in half. 11 points off turnovers, four on second chance. When you think about going to play where they're going to play, Carolina on Saturday, as we mentioned, for my birthday, I'm sure that's why they set it up that way. (laughs) Second chance points, Points in transition, turn points off turnovers. Those are the two biggest statistics when you face the Tar Heels. Well, it's, it's especially off turnovers and w- when Carolina gets out in transition. Tr- traditionally, the Tar Heels are a bear on the offensive glass. This team's a little different yeah. with Hubert Davis, though, Mike. That's why I think Saturday is even more intriguing. Because now, you know, especially with Brady Manick, the, the, the transfer from Oklahoma, and Dawson Garcia, the transfer from Marquette, Carolina is more four out, one in than it's ever been under Roy or Bill Guthridge or Dean. You know, they, they always had those two traditional bigs, and they're just going to pulverize you on the boards. Well, well, not now. Carolina wants to spread you out more. And again, you, you and I were corresponding earlier this week. The last two seasons, the Tar Heels have been below 260th in the country in three-point accuracy. This year, they are top 10. And, you know, they, they play tonight in South Bend against Notre Dame. Eager to watch that, pr- presuming my weary eyes can can stay awake. For, <laughs> for Virginia and Clemson and Georgia Tech Duke kept me up past 11 last night, so I made it. But I'm, I'm really interested to watch Virginia guard this kind of new version of of Carolina that we presumably will see at the Smith Center Saturday afternoon. 
Yeah, it's a fascinating hybrid of what they've always been and and I guess what they're morphing into. And um, But that being said, we've, we've got a Virginia team that is playing much better. You know, if you had asked me on New Year's Eve, uh, what did I think about this matchup? I, I would have said, you know, Tar Heels by 15. Uh, <laughs> now we've got a, a win, a, a road win at Syracuse, a road win at Clemson. And, and Jaden Gardner talked about that after the Clemson win. Rolling off the Syracuse win, this team is starting to get some momentum. Heading into Chapel Hill this Saturday, but uh, we're starting to get back on track. The things that uh, we do well, and we're addressing them, and we're just gonna—it's a long season, so we're gonna be playing our best basketball come March. That's all that matters. Everybody wants to be playing their their best basketball come March, and and the big topic lately has been how many ACC teams might we see <laughs> in March because things have not gone well for the conference. David, I, I know I say this every week, and I get it wrong every week, but right now. I feel firmly that Carolina is the second best team in the ACC. Yes. Uh, are you with me on that? And, and who else do we like? Because we've got a Louisville team that I feel like has been a little bit under the radar because of some consistency issues. And we've got a Miami team who the schedule hasn't been particularly tough, but um, that record-wise, they're right up there too. So what do we like at the top of the ACC? Well, Mike, yes, I agree with you that, that Carolina is the second best team team in the league right now. And oh, by the way, do you think Hubert Davis might mention to the Tar Heels that they've lost to UVA seven <laughs> consecutive times? How's that for motivation? Before, but before that game Saturday, I mean, th- there are few, if any, streaks in UVA sports history that the orange and blue crowd has reveled in more than this. I mean, because after so many years and decades of uh, heartbreaking losses to to Carolina in basketball, and even in football, yeah, you know the the, the tables have have turned of late. But but more to your point, at the risk of patting both of ourselves on the back, I'm almost certain in preseason on the podcast you said you liked Louisville kind of as a dark yeah. horse. And I know I said, I kind of thought Miami was undervalued. You did. And, 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 and here we are and it could all t- turn in, in a minute, but right now both are playing well. Neither has lost in the league. You know, Miami is especially on, on the offensive end. Miami and Louisville are really kind of polar opposites. Miami with, with, with Cam McGusty and uh, Isaiah Wong has been so good on offense, eh, on defense. Flip the, flip the script with Louisville. You know, we talked to Chris Mack on, on the ACC call the other day, and he just he raved uh, uh, about his defense, especially Malik Williams and the transfer Gerard West from Marshall. Yeah, he, Chris Mack told me in the preseason that if everybody on his team guarded like Gerard West, they would be really elite defensively, and uh, it, it's come to fruition that way for him. And All right, so so how about who else? Because I've said a few times, and I've been wrong now a few times on Florida State, we gave me credit for being right on Louisville. Let's Ooh. be fair. And I thought Florida State was a typical, deep, athletic, maybe even a little more talented Leonard Hamilton kind of team, and they, David, they've stunk on ice. What's going on with the Seminoles? What was the final last night in, in Winston? I think the final margin was 21, 22. Uh, Wake, maybe, is it Wake Forest? I mean, <laughs> I mean, really, Steve Forbes, two of the most impressive ACC wins of the year. But to win by 18 at Virginia Tech and to win by 20-some at home last night, against Florida State. Alondis Williams, the transfer from Oklahoma, has been so good for the Deacons. And maybe they're for real. I've been kind of a doubting Thomas on them. Mike, what about you? Yeah, I, I still don't buy it, but I don't know why, right? Like, like you said, it, I mean, that win at Castle should have won me over by itself. A road win that uh, definitive. And, you know, maybe we weren't sure what to make of Tech at that point, but um, I like Steve Forbes. I, I think he's a good coach. I think that we have a little bit, and everyone cover your ears, I think we have a little bit of what we see in football with Coastal Chaos where, yeah, Duke's great, and I think Carolina, Louisville are, are, are really, really good. And then after that, yeah, I think that the league is pretty winnable if, if you're gunning for that fourth, fifth, sixth spot. So I think there can be some teams that maybe don't blow us away, 
but their final record is going to blow us away because I, I think there's opportunity. Let's say it that way, right? I think there's opportunity to win ACC games. Now, how will the NCAA selection committee view that, right? Like yeah. is winning a, ACC, winning ACC games used to be enough to get you in the tournament, right? You could stink in your non-conference and people would kind of grouse and grumble in, in, in the fan base, but if you took care of business in the ACC, you were headed to the NCAA tournament. David, I don't know if that's the case this year because I think this is a, another one of those down years in the ACC. Now, again, creates opportunity for some other teams to, to get in the picture, but may hurt them come selection time. Yeah, the metrics are too sophisticated, Mike, and the schedule's too imbalanced for just to, to say, okay, if you have a winning record in the ACC, you're getting in the tournament. And you used to be able to do that. Those of us who like projecting the bracket, it used to be pretty easy. Even if you were 500 in the ACC, there was a, I'd say, 75% chance yeah. you were you were getting in the in the field. Not anymore, especially with the elimination of double round robin because of conference expansion, and and yes, just more, more advanced metrics. And and I would I would throw Clemson in that mix. That, that we were talking about also. I, I think the Tigers are, are pretty good. They're an older group. They're, they're a good three-point shooting team. Even in defeat last night, I think Clemson was 9 for 20 beyond the arc. That, that'll play on, on any night. That's 45%. Mm-hmm. So I, I think Clemson c- can be among those teams, you know, jockeying for that four, five, six, seven uh, seed come uh, March in Brooklyn. No, I think it's going to make it interesting. And, and we both went into the year thinking UVA and Tech uh, would both be NCAA tournament bound. Uh, how did that play out remains to be seen. But Jaden Gardner believes, you heard him say, UVA is still kind of rounding into form. I know Virginia Tech's players, they feel the same way. And uh, that brings us to this week's edition of Who You Got. Thank you, Mike. One week into the new year, which of these two schools will finish higher in the ACC standings, Virginia Tech or UVA? Who you got? Let's start with David. Guys, uh, I'm a numbers geek, and right now UVA is 3-1 and one in the league, and Virginia Tech is 0-3 and, and has to go to Charlottesville in its next game. To me, that makes this, as we sit right now, I'm taking UVA to finish ahead of the Hokies. All right, David. Thank you. Mike? Which makes a lot of sense, right? If, if, if you're spotting me three in the loss column, <laughs> uh, how do I feel about that? But the thing for Virginia Tech is we love this team because of its veteran makeup, right? Keve Alumas played a lot. Hunter Couture has now played a lot. Nahima Lean has now played a lot. So I still think there's a chance for... Virginia Tech to get back to what we expected them to be. I don't think they're going to be as rattled as um, a Virginia team that's breaking in a lot of new guys, some young guys, the transfers. It's so interesting because I think for both teams, the tide turns if their outside shooter, Naheem Aline at Tech, Armand Franklin at at Virginia, if those guys get going. So is it a question of who do I trust to get going more? Well, I've seen maybe more of Naheem Aline. I think Virginia Tech, by the time the the ACC tournament starts, will be the team that, that is the higher seed, will have the better record. But, man, you're right, David, from a number standpoint, they got some work to do. They, they absolutely do. And I, I, I will give Hokies faithful this ray of hope. Virginia Tech is 0-3, maybe looking at 0-4. The last team to start ACC play 0-3 or 0-4 and make the NCAA tournament was Syracuse. In 2016, and oh, by the way, that orange bunch made the Final Four, beat at, UVA. Say at the expense the, of UVA. And the Midwest Regional Final at the United Center. A, uh, a favorite memory probably for Tech fans, not so much if you're UVA. And just another one of those weird years where the Jim Beheim team that we thought maybe was on the bubble of not going to the tournament ends up in the final four. How many, how many times have we seen Jim Beheim and Syracuse do that? Well, it is basketball season and, and there's so much coming our way and, and we're loving it, but football's still hanging on David to some of the headlines. Uh, we have players transferring coaches being hired. Uh, one of our two schools actually got to play its bowl game. <laughs> uh, UVA's <laughs> trip to Boston to play SMU in the Fenway bowl. That was wiped out by COVID issues in the Virginia program. Uh, did we really go go three segments into the show today without 
really bringing up COVID other than uh, your personal other than my case. <laughs> Yeah, we, we didn't really hit on how it's impacted sports. I guess we were more uh, worried and focused on how it's kept you in your room. But, uh, David, you're not alone. COVID is, is still impacting other people as well. That's um, good to know. Yeah, it's, it's not it's not just a you thing. Um, it did wipe out Virginia's uh, appearance in the bowl. But Virginia Tech made its trip to New York City, played Maryland in the pinstripe bowl. Maybe, maybe wishes it didn't. Maybe right. wishes it had been in isolation. You were there, David, at, at Yankee Stadium to, to witness uh, an historic game in a venue like that and, and an historic beatdown in terms of the margin. What were your takeaways? Well, Mike, I don't think either of us are – Many of our listeners were surprised that Maryland beat Virginia Tech. The Hokies roster was so depleted. So many guys, portal, injury, opt out, however uh, the, the attrition was caused. But 54 to 10, the largest margin of defeat in ACC Bowl history. A record, by the way, held previously by UVA with two 42-point losses, the most recent being to Navy in the 2007 Military Bowl. But I don't think anybody saw that coming because, you know, Maryland was 6-6 six and six too for a reason, and the Terps had not been remotely competitive against the best teams in the Big Ten East, you know, Michigan, Michigan State, and, and Penn State. But yet it was it was a whitewash from the start, and I think just emphasizes the work that Brent Pry and his staff have to do moving forward, especially in my mind, they've got to find a quarterback and they've got to find some edge pass rushers. What do we make of, of the staff hire so far for, for Brent Pry? And, and he's – you know, retained a couple of familiar names in, in J.C. Price and uh, Pearson Prelu on the defensive side. He's um, building himself in, in offensive staff. You know, Brent Pry is, is a defensive guy, uh, his background. What do you make of the construction and the hire so far for Brent Pry at Virginia Tech? Well, Mike, his offensive line coach, yeah. Joe Rudolph from Wisconsin, I'm just like, wow, how'd he get that cat? I mean, you look at Joe Rudolph's track record as as an O line guy, and if you're a Hokies fan, you how could you not be excited by that? And to, to me, that's that's the highlight so far. Uh, he he skewed young with his defensive coordinator in Robert Marv, who who comes from from Florida State. Uh, his, his offensive coordinator, Tyler Bowen, has yet to be announced, but he's going to come from the Jacksonville Jaguars, where he just spent this season as, as the tight ends coach. He has worked with Brent Pry at, at Penn State. So, you know, those hires aren't as, you know, eye-catching. So we'll see how, how, how they work out. But, you know, there, there's a mix. I'm glad, and I think it's smart, that he kept some hokey flavor. Uh, on the staff and that JC price connection, you know, may work out quite nicely because JC price came from Marshall and there's a quarterback in the portal from Marshall who, who, who just hit there a couple days ago named Grant Wells, who threw for a bunch of yards for the herd through, through a bunch of interceptions too, by the way. But is, is, is he the answer? for Virginia Tech at quarterback. I have I do not know, but I am sure that he is on Virginia Tech's radar uh in the portal. Yeah, and you mentioned, you know, the quarterback and and I think it's going to be really interesting. So many people want to know, okay, Tyler Bowen, Brad Glenn who's going to be the passing game coordinator. Um mm-hmm. you mentioned Joe Rudolph and and what he's done at Wisconsin. What the vision of this offense is going to be? Right, because in those three guys, you have three pretty different backgrounds. Um, obviously, Glenn is the passing game coordinator. He's a guy who's known for airing it out and, and spreading the ball around. And, and mm-hmm. um, you know, you look at Rudolph and you think about Wisconsin. You think about power run game, right? Yes. Five big guys up front that are kind of what Tech used to be. They're going to mm-hmm. line up and smack you, and they're going to have a back who can smack you, but can also break off a big run. And um, I think Tech fans would love to see that identity return. But David, I, I think that and obviously the long-term vision of the offense 
is going to be something crafted by these men we're talking about, these coaches. I think the short-term vision of the offense, it's going to come down to who can they find to play quarterback. Because if you want to be competitive, you're going to have to build around that guy, at least for this coming season. Yes, you're going to have to build around that guy and and, and the skilled people are, are around him. But ha- having listened to, to, to Brent Pry several times now, Mike, and, and, and having talked to him in, in very small group settings on a couple of occasions, it seems to me that he wants to be more of a traditional off. I don't think we're going to see air raid in Blacksburg. And I know Brad Glenn worked with Armani Edwards at, at App State, and they were, they were putting up all, all kinds of numbers. But I, I think it's going to be a whole lot of let's let's line up and run it when we need to and force impose our will, so to speak, uh, on the opponent. And a lot of that Armani Edwards offense, if you go back, was quarterback run, too, mm-hmm. um, which can play into that identity. I think people still get caught up in the idea that, that you know, the running quarterback is this like dazzling, spinning speedster. There are plenty of teams that churn out yards. We saw Virginia Tech do it with Gerard Evans. Not that sure. he couldn't break off a big one, but um, I think that that is more the part of um, our passing game coordinator hire here. I think that's more of what they're bringing um, is the, some of that quarterback run stuff uh, behind a line, you know, put together uh, by Joe Rudolph. And I think it's going to be interesting. And, and, and again, you know, you, you try to look at the staff they're hiring and kind of guess where they're going. So let's play the same game at Virginia, um, which we mentioned didn't get a chance to play its bowl game. So no final game for Bronco Mendenhall. Tony Elliott, the former offensive coordinator at Clemson, the hire at UVA, he was planning to go up to Boston and take that game in. He didn't obviously end up making that trip. He's been busy putting together his staff. He's an offensive guy, David, offensive background. So most of his hires so far have been on that side of the ball, including retaining Marcus Hagens and Garrett Tuje, the offensive line coach. Defensively, are we assuming he's kind of waiting to hire the coordinator and then let that guy shape the staff? I, th- that's my hunch. It, it, it appears if if you listen to the to the coaching scoop websites and such, you know maybe Brad Lambert was a target of Virginia for the defensive co- coordinator spot. He eventually elected to to go to to Wake Forest. Instead, he has coached there before. He is he was the defensive coordinator at, at Purdue this season. The former head coach. At, at Charlotte. But yeah, Mike, I think your hunch is a good one. You know, the, the official announcement yesterday of, of Des Kitchings as, as the offensive coordinator, a lot of ACC experience on his resume, particularly at North Carolina State, spent this season as the running backs coach, uh, maybe the last two seasons, in fact, with the, with the Atlanta Falcons and he's headed to Charlottesville. Uh, I, I think Garrett Tuj, given his um, track record in developing NFL caliber offensive linemen, is a good retention. Marcus Hagens, what he did with Virginia's receivers, to me, has just been out, outstanding. And just he he's a cavalier, true and true and through. Uh, so I, I like those hires. Tuj's got some work though. <laughs> because they are losing guys. You know, when 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 you send Olu to Michigan and when you send Bobby Haskins to, to USC and then Bissinger transfers to SMU, they got some reconstruction to do on that offensive line. Yeah, I, I don't know how to feel for Garrett Two J if I should be, you know, happy that he was retained for for him or um sad for him that he's got to do it again. Because if you remember the the storyline of the Bronco tenure was the offensive line yes. was terrible, the offensive line was terrible, then the offensive line got to bad, then the offensive line got to okay, then the offensive line got to pretty good, and then it got to hyped up as being, you know, one of the strengths of the team. I mean, you remember the, the first year, Kurt Benkert playing behind that line and just getting pummeled. Uh, Bryce Perkins, so much of that first year offense with him was running him away from what they knew was going to be lousy protection. Um, Garrett Tuje turned that unit around and he didn't take shortcuts, right? Like it, they brought in some transfers, some guys who played well. I remember Marcus Applefield as a guy that he credited with um, really helping change the culture of the line. But for the most part, it was young guys developing, developing, developing. and um, 
he's a little bit back to square one now, David. And and we've seen him on the recruiting trail. If you if you follow him on Twitter or, or you follow the recruiting sites, every day it's two or three more guys getting a, a new offer or a reoffer from from Garrett Two J to come join the offensive line. A lot of work to do there. No question, and and work on the, on the defensive side too. You know, Noah Taylor go, going to you know coastal rival Carolina. You know, that's that's a tough loss. So the the Cavaliers ha- have some rebuilding to do, and we still haven't heard Mike from Brennan Armstrong. Yeah. I mean, I I guess he's he's coming back, but I'll tell you what, with with all this attrition around him, I mean, if you were in Brennan Armstrong's shoes, and I know he's already said I wouldn't, you know, I'm not going to consider transferring. Would you have second thoughts on that stance? If it were from me, a yeah. purely football standpoint. Yeah, if it were me, yeah, and um, maybe that says more about Brennan Armstrong's you know, character and commitment than mine. But yeah, I, I mean, I would look at um, you know th- because it's not it's not the shame or the scarlet letter that it used to be to transfer, right? Like now, it's everyone does it. I mean, you look at, at you know you've got Heisman winners, Heisman candidates who've gone the transfer route. Uh, you know, Spencer Rattler, who was the Heisman favorite a year ago when the year started, he's going to play for Shane Beamer at South Carolina. I, I just um, I'd be surprised if he isn't hearing from, even if it's unofficial oh, back channel, hearing oh, from every ma- right, hearing from every major program. Um, because wh- why would you not want Brennan Armstrong? Now, I will say a lot of his receivers are, are coming back. Yeah. Um, Coach Hagen's coming back, I think, helps uh, in that regard. They have a good relationship. I was surprised that um, Jason Beck didn't didn't get <laughs> retained just for the idea of can you keep Brennan Armstrong? Yeah. Um, it's going to be interesting. And, 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 you know, I asked Brennan and um, when Tony Elliott was introduced and he was very firm in what he told me that, you know, yeah. he might go to the NFL if that evaluation came back. That's not what Bronco uh, was expecting, um, but that he wouldn't transfer. And, and I was surprised he was that firm about it, but he, he was very, he was very firm. And I didn't, I didn't specifically ask that. He kind of wanted to, to put that out there of, you know, if I'm back in college, it'll be UVA, but you're right. I mean, I would imagine for the past month and a half, Oh boy, he's been hearing from just about everybody, and, and it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. And man, if you're Tony Elliott, how much do you want that cat back behind center for your first season? Yes, in a big way. Absolutely. Well, that does bring us to this week's uh, edition of Take It or Leave It, and, and it is about the future of, of both UVA and Tech football. Thank you, Mike. Virginia Tech ended its regular season with a win over UVA. And at this moment, with so much change still coming from the uh, transfer portal, the Hokies will be the better team again in 2022. So take it or leave it. Let's start with Mike. Oh, man, I don't know if I like either of these teams, so it's a tough question. <laughs> I mean, I, if you tell me that Brennan Armstrong's coming back, uh, I would give the, the, the nod to UVA. If you tell me who Virginia Tech's transfer quarterback is, maybe I tip the other way, but um, I'm just going to go with what is on their current roster. And, and on their current roster, I'm going to take UVA, even though I have doubts about their line. Um, I'm going to give the edge there to, to Virginia, but man, there are so many variables in this one that um, I'm glad you said at this moment, because come back and check after spring ball. And I may have a very different opinion. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. David. Guys, I, I know the golden rule of content is to provide conflict and <laughs> disagreement and, and pit the talking heads against one another. But you, you're right, Mike. Brennan Armstrong as as we sit here right now at 10:42 on on Wednesday Wednesday morning as we record is UVA's quarterback we don't know who Virginia Tech's starting quarterback is is going to be next season and yes i know next year's commonwealth cup game is in blacksburg but right now because of number 5 still being on that UVA roster that's where I would side. It took Bryce Perkins two cracks, right, against Tech to, to break through. So mm-hmm. might be the same. And, and you're right, man. I mean, depending on who they land at quarterback. Hey, we also don't know, before before we end today, we want to hit this. We also don't know who will be announcing the games for Virginia Tech. Our friend yeah. John Laser announced that, that he's stepping away from the booth. And uh, John's done tremendous work in the radio booth for Virginia Tech. He's also done some tremendous work 
away from from the headset. Um, his Clean Mountain Air initiative, uh, raising money, raising awareness for for athletes' mental health, and uh, it, it's a cause that's near and dear to his heart. Um, goes back to his father. So, um, you know, we certainly wish wish John the best. He's been been a great one to be around. He really has, and you know, Mike. He 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 talked about in his in his Twitter announcement that he was at peace uh, with his decision, said it was difficult, but that he was excited for the good that can be done ahead. And I, I know this mental health initiative, as, as you referenced, is very important to both him and Renee. And if, 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 that, it, if that needs to be the focus for them right now, then Godspeed to them both. Hey Mike, but before we before we close today, since we're almost have a weekly habit of making predictions gone wrong, who you like Monday night? Georgia, Alabama? Yeah, I I, I like that game. I, I know a lot of people are saying, oh, it's an SEC and it's a rematch. Um, I've thought for a lot of the year that the two best teams in college football were Alabama and Georgia. So I. I'm one of those guys. I have no problem seeing them uh, play again, seeing them play for the the national title. Um, I think it's going to be a good one. I, I, maybe it's just recency. I, I can't. I have a hard time picturing Alabama losing after they've won <laughs> so convincingly. They, I mean, that right. wasn't. You know what I mean? If it had been 31-28 in the last second field goal, but would they win that one by 17 in the SEC title game? Yeah. Um, I mean, Nick Saban Young locked up the Heisman that day. Right. And it just, Alabama looked like what we thought Alabama was going to look like all, all year. And, and Georgia, who has been an outstanding team and, and great defensively, um, they looked exposed to, to me. And, and yeah, could it have been an off day? And could, could the national championship game Monday night be, be much more competitive? I hope so. Uh, I'm going to have a pot of chili and I'll, and, and I'll be sitting there and um, some buffalo chicken dip. And, and I hope it's a great one. But um, what I saw from Alabama, what I've seen from Georgia, it's too much, and I and I like the Crimson Tide. Well, I'm I'm gonna go opposite of you, Mike, for for a couple of reasons. Number one, our good friend Norm Wood is a Georgia grad and a devoted Bulldogs fan, and I have another very close friend who who loves him some some Georgia football. So not only in honor of them, but because. Jimbo Fisher finally broke through this year. He became the first former Nick Saban assistant to beat the boss when Texas A&M defeated Alabama, granted the Crimson Tide's only setback this season, and Kirby Smart, another former Saban assistant, is going to do the same thing Monday night in Indianapolis and George is going to get its first natty since 1980. That, that would be something, David. I don't know that I'm buying the because it finally happened, now it's going to happen <laughs> all the time mentality. In fact, I might go the opposite. How many years was it without Nick Saban losing to one of his assistants? I think we may be ready for him to start a new run like that, but uh, maybe we should have some kind of bet. Off the air, we'll have to come up with some kind of a, a bet, but uh, one thing we can agree on, I think we would both love to to see Norm <laughs> celebrate his, his school winning a national title. That, that would, would certainly make it fun. Yes, sir. Thanks to all of you for listening. Happy New Year. You can subscribe to Teal and Barber on Apple Podcasts or wherever you find your favorite pods. And please consider supporting local journalism with an online subscription to the Times Dispatch. You forget to send somebody a Christmas gift, you still have time to make up for it. Send them a subscription to Richmond. You can find special promotional offers available at the website richmond.com. Today's show was produced by Dean Hoffmeyer. Teal and Barber is a podcast of the Richmond Times Dispatch and Richmond.com. For David Teal, I'm Mike Barber. Thanks for listening. Be healthy and safe. And please join David and me again next time.